Okay, hello everybody, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Ashley Elgrisma. I'm a part of the events team at Swiss, and I'd like to welcome you to our brown bag event, Careers in STEM, Quality Assurance and Cybersecurity. Before I begin, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, we would like to take a moment to reflect on our connections to the land, thank the traditional guardians of the land that we that which we at Swiss Vancouver live and work. Vancouver is on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Musqueam, Sailwatooth, Seychelles, Squamish, and the indigenous people of Turtle Island. Just some housekeeping rules before we begin. This video, this event will be recorded. So if you don't want your image in the video, please turn off your video. Um, and also please mute your microphones. We will all take the oath that we will keep our microphones muted as, not, as to not interrupt the presentation. The chat box will be monitored for questions, and then we will ask them during the question and answer section of this presentation. Our speaker today is Gyathri Gopalakrishnan. She is the Senior Quality An Analyst at Network Security Group, or Sophos Network Security Group. This is a leading cybersecurity company that develops next generation endpoint protection. She has her engineering degree, as well as two decades of experience in IT. She's an advocate for diversity at Sophos and a member of many teams at Sophos for diversity and mentorship. So I'll stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. All right, I will share my screen. You can see my screen? Yes? Yes, yes. All right, okay. Uh, so I am Gayatri. Lakshmi Gopalakrishnan, also very easily called G, uh, with the Network Security Group in Sofas. And I want to actually start by thanking Dr. Noreen Malik for giving uh, me this opportunity to be part of Squist and get to uh, talk as part of Squist. I think it's pretty awesome. And definitely, I want to thank Amy and the others at Sofos for giving me this opportunity. And I'm starting with the thank you first, because I'm known to talk a lot, so I don't know if I'll get time to come back to the end of it. So I want to start with a thank you. So uh, yeah, so let me just move on. So this will hopefully be a little peek into a QA mindset or a QA mind. And uh, moving on, this is a representation of my body of work because I like puns. So I am moving on with my body and I would like to start with the head of where this journey of QA and cybersecurity began and possibly where the seed of STEM was planted. Uh, so I was born and brought up in Kuwait and I was the daughter of a math teacher and uh, my dad was an engineer. So math and science both played a very important part in my family. Uh, my dad would like teach us the working of machines and, you know, uh, get us to design different things, work on algorithms and uh, engineering and coming up with that kind of algorithm thinking is something that was probably seeded from childhood. And I definitely had an interest in puzzles and an interest in solving logic puzzles, uh, competitive exams and things like that. So that's where the interest of math and problem solving was. And since I am interested in puzzles, I am now going to ask you guys a puzzle and whoever is can reply on chat within five seconds would be awesome. Or you can just unmute and reply. So two doctors said Robert was their brother, but Robert said he had no brothers. So who was lying? You have five seconds, go. Anybody? Come on, any one person, it's easy. Two doctors said Robert was their brother, but Robert said he had no brothers. Who I was put it in chat, but the doctors are sisters. Yay, okay, Michael then got the answer. Yes, doctors were sisters. Surprisingly, I asked my daughter this question. She is 11 years old yesterday, and she took 10 whole minutes to come up with this answer. So it's also, she's probably not great at puzzle solving, and it's also obvious that the conversation of women in uh, these kind of positions is not that much talked about, which is why our mind just goes to the men. But yep, moving on. Uh, so after uh, finishing grade 10 in Kuwait, I moved on to India uh, to move into grade 11. And that's when we get to pick either the biology stream or the computer science stream. And doctor or engineer, I wanted to be a doctor. 
precisely I wanted to be a doctor in the Indian Army. So I took the biology stream and that's what I studied. But by the time we came to uh, joining university, there was a big dot-com boom and uh, computers was a big hit and I knew it was a good money-making industry and it was also definitely math and physics and right up my alley. So I then joined engineering in 2001. I did a BTEC IT. And uh, after that, I joined Infosys through a campus interview. So at this point, I'd like to say a little story. So uh, when I attended uh, campus interviews when we have different companies that come into the university campus and interview you. So this was the first ever time I was ever being interviewed and I spend my time catching up on all my subjects and studying and being very prepared. And my dad used to always tell me to read the newspaper, which I never used to do. And coincidentally, a couple of days before he had actually shown me a newspaper article from the Economic Times, which I remember was about SSL actually, Secure Soft Layers, and uh, asked me to read it, and I did. And then I forgot about that, and when I went to the interview, they didn't really ask me any technical questions. They just asked me, do you read the newspaper? And I was like, yes, because I just did. And I actually got to quote different points from the uh, newspaper article, and they were quite impressed that I read the Economic Times, and I'm thinking that's why I got the job. So uh, two tips from this, one is listen to your parents, and uh, the second one is to always be informed. I think it's quite important to know more about the world around you than just the subject you're studying. So those are two tips I had there. Anyway, I uh, started working in Infosys and uh, being the first company I joined, we got projects in different areas in the software industry. So I worked in manual QA, I worked in test automation, uh, most more in the routing suite kind of subject. and. I also did a little bit of development, which I'm pretty sure my manager right now will find surprising, but I did a bit of development there and worked on the design and documentation team, et cetera. And then I took a couple of years leave as a maternity break after my two children. So during that time, I still wanted to keep working because after a while, just two kids at home gets a little crazy. So I did a bit of freelancing work with Elance, which is also named as Upwork. And then in 2012, I finally decided to join back the industry and I joined Motorola and worked there for about two years. This was more on the mobile industry with access points and the Cisco firewall, et cetera. And after this is where we, I decided the heart of the matter was that I was interested in QA and that was the direction I wanted to proceed. So moving on, what does the QA do? The roots of QA, I just recently read about it, was apparently from uh, after the World War, there was uh, Edward Deming, many of you would have heard about him, and TQM, and he is the one who started, especially with the auto industry, said that we should spend more money on uh, ensuring quality, and that actually saves you both time and brings you greater profits in the future. So that's actually where the seed of QA uh, in the industry was actually planted, and Moving on from that, uh, as we all know, quality is a pretty important part of the software industry and any industry actually, because that's what has all the various strategies and the different approaches that you are used to, you know, test an application and make sure it behaves the way it sh should behave, which would include different kinds of testing, you know, unit testing and system testing and end user testing and security testing. There is so many aspects to the things you need to test to make sure it works and to find problems. So QAs find problems and developers fix them. Is that right? No, it's not. QA is actually a continuous exercise in problem solving, creative problem solving. So let's take the example of uh, what I was doing last weekend, which is trying to find how the spiders were getting into my house. So just finding these bugs and finding the spiders and then killing them is not going to solve the problem. We needed to actually investigate and find out where were these spiders actually entering from to solve that problem. So a fix in any sort of code could usually just be a single line or in a particular area, and that's all the developer needs to fix. But the more important part here is doing the investigation of finding out, narrowing the search, uh, changing the environments and variables, and actually trying to figure out what caused the bug in the first place or what area the bug was in. And that is just as important to uh, fixing it 
than as what the developer does. I mean, they do an awesome job too. So it is a partnership that everybody works in, which brings me to the line that uh, Thomas, uh, I forgot what is his name? Thomas Harris, he is the author of Hannibal Lecter. He says this line, which I love, which is problem solving is hunting. It is savage pleasure and we're born to it. So definitely there is the sense of satisfaction that you get when you uh, discover a bug and you find out where this bug is happening and then you're able to get it fixed. So what does it take to be a good QA? So these are some of the uh, maybe qualities that it takes to be a good QA and the qualities that I felt I was stronger in, which is why I moved on this path, which is especially a curiosity of constantly asking what if and keen observation skills, having that sense of satisfaction when you are able to find a bug, being thorough and objective and methodical in your approach to solving issues and uh, finding the weakness in IT systems, especially when it comes to uh, security, you really need to be able to put yourself into the mindset of people and try to see how you can break the system. So these are some of the uh, things that it takes to be a good QA. So moving on, uh, getting hands on. So this is where I actually started working in QA would be in 2014 when we moved to Canada as a family. And here there were challenges of a new country, young children, no Canadian experience. Uh, with all of this stuff, I actually took almost a year to start working. And so this was, it's not really a story, but then basically the thing is, this is a thing that many people, many women also do is, you think always that to start applying for a job, you need to know everything that there is to know. I was looking into different certifications that I should do. How do I get this Canadian experience and all this sort of mental thinking, but didn't actually take the first step for almost the first nine months. And then uh, decided that you know, maybe just take the leap and apply for the job and then start learning to the roles that you needed to learn for. And once I started applying within a month, I was very lucky to be placed in SoFo which is one of the best companies I've ever worked at. And I joined Sophos in 2015. The uh, working model in Sophos was a little different from the previous company. The teams were more agile and you worked closely with the whole development process and with different technologies and tools. And that's where my journey in Sophos started. So this is when I was introduced to this whole new industry. We see these articles in the news all the time, cybercrime. Cybercrime is almost the new uh, war. They always predict the next war that would be, would be in cybercrime. So it is almost the most important industry. Robert Mueller, who is the um, former director of the FBI, even said that um, if you are there, are there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. Uh, the, the, does anybody want to take a guess at how much Canadians have actually lost due to ransomware, which is one of the big malware that is now taking over the industry? Well, I don't know if anybody answered, but okay. In Canada, apparently it has, the McCarthy Data Group reported that Canadians lost almost 4.9 billion over the last year and the US, I mean, Canadians lost, yeah, 4.9 billion and the US lost almost 9 billion over the last year. There are almost 600,000 Facebook accounts that are being hacked every day and cybercrime is huge. So which is why it is highly important for us to invest in cybersecurity. Uh, this is the Sophos website's first page, and it basically just says Sophos stops ransomware. That is good enough for us to know how important cybersecurity is and what a big role Sophos plays in it. For those who don't really know ransomware, I think it is super interesting. It's almost like watching Money Heist, the whole logic of a program that, uh, you know, that comes into your system and then locks up your data and encrypts it. And now you have to actually pay a ransom to get access to your own data, which is really cool. It's putting yourself into the minds of hackers or these kind of virus creators is highly interesting. This is what makes cybersecurity a very challenging and exciting industry to be in. So uh, this is where Sophos is a big player. And this is why I feel uh, cybersecurity is always be a growing industry because uh, businesses everywhere are digitalizing. It's fast-paced, it's ever-changing, it's not ever going to be the same old kind of uh, only phishing methodologies of getting, uh, you know, hacking into people's information. It's incredibly interesting and it expands through all the different layers of the, you know, the OSI model. They can hack from the application layer right down to the network layer. So it's really interesting to be a QA in cybersecurity because you get to 
think like a hacker. So uh, the next thing would be, so this is the QA, uh, being a QA in cybersecurity industry. How do you keep it healthy? How do you sustain this? Which is why I'm going right on to the stomach. Staying relevant is very important. Uh, the industry is constantly changing, whether it is the new vulnerabilities that come up or whether there is new kind of risks that are introduced or even the different kind of practices when it comes to QA. So uh, quality analysis itself is now very, very focused on speed, which is why automation is a huge part of the industry and there are different automation tools that are coming in. Uh, there is agile and DevOps related testing. There is more API related testing and there is artificial intelligence coming in testing. So with all of these different uh, testing tools that are coming up, it is important to keep abreast and learn all of these different technologies and all of the different tools. There are also different certifications and courses that you can do, uh, or there are different podcasts, like you have Naked Security Podcast from Sophos, which is very interesting, and they have different blogs that they keep putting out, and all of these are important and interesting ways to uh, stay relevant. The next important thing is promoting diversity in STEM. So our strength lies in our diversity and a big part of this that I really discovered in SOFOS was being open-minded to different kinds of people and thinking and being open to conversations. I find in the industry, a uh, lot of the problems of uh, not being inclusive in diversity is because people are not very open to asking questions or answering questions. And I find that mindset quite different in SOFOS where people are very open to talking about their cultures and uh, their countries and things like that, where you're able to understand more about the other person and it, you know, it actually inculcates mutual respect between people. And at SOFOS, we have a lot of different things in the SOFOS culture where we celebrate uh, pride, we celebrate different cultures, we celebrate different festivals. We are encouraged to learn about different kinds of communities. We have workshops, we have, uh, trivia games and things like that, which help us to learn about different communities. We have things where we promote women in STEM by you know, bring your daughter to work day, which was really nice. We have family day where we got to meet people's families, encourage women to you know talk about their families and be a working woman. We have workshops and training and we have the social women in technology group, uh, which really promotes diversity. So these are the some of the really cool ways of staying relevant. And the other important thing is right attitude. This is, uh, I think this is things that everybody knows, but these are some of the things that I find are quite important is to be respectful and have a sense of humor. I really think a great team needs to have a great sense of humor, uh, being open-minded and communicating and asking questions and being ready to accept when you don't know something and you ask questions. So um, focusing on quality over quantity are some of the, ways that you have a right attitude to be in the team. And this is where I would like to add a couple of pointers from some really amazing women in my team who said, uh, these are the things that they enjoy about the industry. And these are some of the tips that they use to, uh, you know, to manage their time and to be focused and to be a strong working woman in STEM. Moving on. Uh, so we all, so these are all the different things that we do to, you know, keep alive in the industry, but we always need a support system. So I'm going right down to the knees to our support system. Finding support within the team. Uh, reach out within your team and feel free to ask questions. Uh, my team, I'm lucky to say, is very open to being supportive. People answer questions all the time. People look out for each other. People are always ready to spend the time to guide you and I try to return the same favor. So within your team, you can always find support if you look for it. You can find support within your family, uh, especially being a working woman, you need to get other help from your family and be open to asking help, to delegating, to getting the kids to do their own stuff. So that kind of support is important. Uh, within the industry, LinkedIn is a really great platform to uh, meet different kinds of people, to maintain contacts and to uh, use LinkedIn Learning as a tool to actually learn about the industry and to join different organizations like Squiz, for example. Uh, these are great ways to find support within the industry and find support within yourself. Focus on your strength and keep learning and have confidence. 
There's another little uh, story, third little story I like to put in when it comes to uh, having confidence. So when schools uh, first started the Science Symposium and they had their first welcoming session, I was actually approached by Amy asking if I would want to take part and represent SOFOS as a panel. And at this point, my confidence was not enough. So I said, uh, I haven't grown up in Canada. I haven't been educated in Canada. I possibly don't know as much as other women. So I took a step back and said, maybe I'm not the best person to do it. And then uh, I, I thought about it for a day and I was like, okay, this is a good opportunity to actually represent SOFOS, which is a company I love so much. And I can always find out information from people and talk. But uh, by the time we already had uh, Michelle, who uh, represented SOFOS, and she did a beautiful job at the first welcome panel that I saw. So the second time Amy asked me again if I wanted to do the next session, I said yes. And the funny thing was I had first said no to a 15 minute panel, and now I said yes to a one hour brown bag session. But I'm really glad I did because it got me a good uh, chance to actually go back and think about uh, my industry and my journey at SOFOS and STEM. And I definitely feel even as an immigrant woman in Canada, I have so much that I can share. So I'm glad I finally had the confidence to say yes. And I find a lot of really amazing women who don't, who are, don't really have the confidence or are not ready to take that leap to actually showcase their strength. So I would definitely think that is something people should do to showcase your strength, leap first. So. Uh, that is one thing I want to say about finding support. Now, why I find it so being so supportive in this industry in Canada in this new life is because of SOFOS. This company, I think, is very, very supportive. We have so many different initiatives, starting from a mentorship program, you know, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and uh, you know, frequent weekly one-on-ones with your manager where you can always talk about, you know, discuss your growth, talk about issues very openly. HR is always open to any sort of conversations. We have uh, working from home and any sort of adjustments that can be done to make sure you have a good and peaceful uh, work life and at the same time a whole life. And it's a very holistic professional growth that you have at SOFOS. Also, one of the really nice things that I've been enjoying over the last one year is uh, the SOFOS mental health days when the kids have to go to school and your husband has to work, but you get that one day off called mental health day and it does wonders for your mental health. So, SOFOS also promotes uh, your fitness. We have different team events. We have different uh, women in technology initiatives and workshops, you know, with, you know, salary negotiations and how to handle workplace conflicts or just talks by inspiring women across SOFOS, which I find very, very interesting. And this is actually uh, my backyard two years ago when I carved out in the snow because I love SOFOS so much. Even my art has SOFOS in it. So, uh, that is what I want to talk about, support at SOFOS. So with all of these things forming a great base, use your feet and move forward. So taking the next step, you always need to plan where your career wants to grow. And like I was saying, leap first and then learn because we will always find a way to grow and mentor others and be a role model for other women in STEM is something that I would like to do. So uh, all in all, I am very grateful to be a woman in STEM, it is a very challenging, exciting industry, and I would love to promote more women and my daughters also to take up careers in STEM. And I would also like to thank SOFOS for being such an awesome company. And we are ready to welcome more people into SOFOS, which is why we have all of these amazing openings. You can find it in our careers website. And I can also uh, put some of this information in our chat. So that is all I would like to say. and. I think I'm at my 20 minutes, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we'd like to open it up for questions. So if you'd like to send your questions into the chat or put your hand up on the Zoom feature, that would be lovely. Um, I'll start with my questions then. Um, so your job is also very technical and how do you balance all of these technical things along with the social and mentorship programs? At so folks. So uh, our job, so at at uh, at our job, basically we work as a team and we work in different sprints. And uh, like I said, it's a very supportive team environment where we come up with different kind of tools to start doing the job better. And there's constant learning. So there is the work day allocated to that. One of my 
colleague who had actually put in a tip, which was in my presentation, said it really well. She said, focus on work when you're working and focus on your life when you're not working. So that was a very nice way that she had uh, put that. So uh, that was that would be one way I would say that I would definitely uh, focus on learning the technical part because it is definitely a very technical job. And the more you learn the subject and the more you learn the tools, that's how you can be better at it. And at the same time, we have enough time during our work week or during, uh, you know, during course of times where uh, you have initiatives, social events and initiatives that are planned at SOHO's and these are always put into the calendar. And I, for one, love to participate in all of these, whether it is uh, with the women in technology or whether it is the social committee, because I think that's how we uh, are able to communicate with others in the office. And, and that actually really helps even with the technical part, because the more you learn and make contact with the other part of the, the other teams in the company and the other areas that are not just engineering, you get a much better context of what your product does and how your company is represented and the kind of issues that people face and how you need to bring that back into your testing and your growth. So I think it's a, it's a good balance and yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. We also have a question from Amy. She says, how do you think we can encourage more girls into STEM? So this is actually a pretty interesting question, which actually uh, reminds me of when we were interviewing for a role in the team a while ago. And I have been saying for a long time, I wanted to get more women in our team because we have a much lesser number of women, which was way lesser when I started. And now it's growing a whole lot more. But when we interview people, we still have a very few amount of women applicants and we have a lot of male applicants. And I was talking to my manager about it and I was telling him that, you know, we need to get more women in. But at the end of the day, when you're interviewing, uh, you basically are only going to look at them at what they can do. And that's all you're looking for, right? How are they going to be a good fit in the team? And that is all you should look for, which means that uh, the problem is not just in selecting people to join the team, but we need to take go one step further, and which is what he said. So if we want more, uh, if we want to be more diverse as a team, we need to take a step back and make sure we get more applicants who are women. So if we don't get applicants who are women, we are interviewing less women and we are selecting less women, right? So uh, that's where so we need a certain amount of equity to come into place when it comes to selecting people for, you know, doing the initial screening of the candidate itself is also to keep in mind diversity and you know because if you're all just going to be on an equal playing field all the time nothing is ever going to change so we do need some amount of equity there to you know include more women coming into the uh, teams and interviewing for different kind of roles and also uh, you know events like we had uh, bring your daughter to work day my husband actually said why is it not just bring your child to work day why should it be bring your daughter to work day but the reason that is special because is that's when the doctors actually feel that this is a special event planned just for them because this is a field that they can be really great at. And we had one of my colleague's daughter who was actually following me around for a day and I got to talk to her about, um, you know, quality assurance, what QA is like and cybersecurity is like. And it was interesting to enlighten her on that. I find a lot of girls, especially because I have daughters, seem to think for some reason when you say STEM, they just think it means video games and it means a desk job. And she's like, I don't want to sit and do a desk job. But it's not actually just computers. There is everything. There is being a doctor or there is being, an, uh, you know, a biochemist and biosciences. And STEM as a field is a really, really huge field. And the more we talk to them about really cool women who have been in the industry and the more we have, you know, events where girls are made to feel special and girls are challenged and girls solve puzzles and then they feel the sense of satisfaction when they do that, that is uh, definitely a kind of way that I think we should get more women in STEM. I'm sorry, my answers are really, really long. I just tend to talk a lot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, we have another question from Michael. He says, do you think that there's a difference between men and women in terms of work-life balance? How do you think that affects a job like yours? So in all honesty, uh, I would I, I would say that when I was working in India, there was a definite difference between men and women. And or maybe because this is a few years ago, maybe because the culture is different, the women are a little more responsible for their family and, you know, for getting dinner on the table. 
So there was a definite difference in the work-life balance. Men could take a lot of calls in the evening or men could work at a later point of the day. And it was understood that that was their priority, but women had to balance it. But in Canada and in coming to Sophos, I see a lot of families here actually have a really good balance between men and women. Some of uh, the people in my team, they even have both the men and women taking their calls together in the, you know, working in the same room and the children are a shared responsibility. And I think that is really great. Uh, at the same time, I think it is, there is a difference in the mindset of women itself that they feel that they are the family makers, which is perfectly fine. I mean, even me as a mother, I definitely feel that it is my responsibility to uh, make sure that my children grow up right and to make sure they're doing the right thing and to make sure the family is provided for. And a lot of time we don't really uh, ask for help or we feel guilty in delegating. So I think it's more of a mindset when it uh, comes to women and men's shared responsibilities. But at the same time, the industry is not equal yet. Even though we talk about it being equal and talk about opportunities being the same for men and women, we, like I was saying before, we need to move back into an equity mode where it is made equal and where the mindset of people itself is changed. Maybe in the software industry, there is a little less of uh, you know, discrimination between men and women, but in many other industries, there is definitely still discrimination between men and women. So that does put women at a disadvantage and those are that's where the playing field is not really equal. And I really think it should be equal because Women are very, very smart thinkers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question. So especially in the fields of engineering and computer science, when girls are in school, they're typically mostly male dominated fields. So what would you say to some girls who are in, these, in school for these kinds of things right now and they find out they're the only girl in their class? I would say that it is really cool that you're the only girl in the class and that the other girls are not there because they don't know the cool things that you can do and that you should really start showing them, you know, start working on things and show them how cool it is to be a girl in a robotics class, how cool it is to design. I think there is, uh, it definitely girls also need a lot of push from parents in making it sound cool in making sure that a girl who studies and a girl who goes in an engineering line is not a geek. And I think that is, that's, that's kind of the feeling that people have. They feel that if I was in robotics and if I was in the science class with all the boys and all the other girls are just going to think I'm a geek and I'm a nerd and, and I'm not cool. And I think it's quite important to be cool and to you know, bring a lot of fun even and even in the school levels to bring a lot of fun and a lot of visibility into these kind of engineering teams and engineering uh, classes and robotic classes they have and, uh, you know, create girl-centric teams and promote them as really cool people as opposed to really smart people alone. So that, that's, that's one thing I think the mindset in schools needs to change. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, you're welcome to send them in the chat box. Otherwise, I'll just keep asking mine. Um, so you mentioned that the field is changing so quickly. So what do you see for the future of cybersecurity and careers in that field? So uh, cybersecurity is uh, cybersecurity is just getting more and more important and more and more visibility in so many different ways. It is not only about, you know, uh, solving threats anymore, but it is also about preventing threats from happening in the first place and, you know, putting in the placeholders because it is quite expensive for any organization to, uh, you know, solve a vulnerability after it has been discovered and to solve issues after they have happened. So there it's, it's becoming a lot, the industry is focusing a whole lot on placeholders that you can put in to prevent these sort of issues from happening at all in the first place, which requires very expansive thinking, which requires uh, the most important thing, which is coming up in the industry, which has been around for a while, which is AI and machine learning. And more and more of AI and machine learning is being incorporated into cybersecurity products, even into uh, SOFOS products. And in the way, the I think the, in the end, for us to be able to find, fight cybercrime is with cyber tools. So, 
I would definitely think artificial intelligence is the way to go. And for a QA to be able to catch up with that, you have to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in QA tools and automation and things like that, where you can find, you know, to resolve, to find regressions and to find issues that can come up and loopholes that are there in the system in the fastest way possible. So speed is extremely important. And as the world goes on to be faster and faster and you know, things like 5G coming up, we just need to have speed to be able to catch these sort of issues and to be able to uh, you know, prevent. Like for example, the COVID pandemic, it is such a huge issue to solve after the pandemic has happened. And it's the same kind of thing. If you have a virus, like uh, the coronavirus in the cyber world, the whole world would shut down. So definitely preventing that is the is the way to go and preventing that is the thing that's taking priority in the industry. Thank you. So as you, oh, I have another, I think, oh, just a comment. Maybe I'll just mention it, might be easier. Um, so, uh, I, I went through BCIT post-secondary in the 90s, and at that point in time, there was uh, kind of an investigation on why there were not more girls in computer science. And now, so this is in the 90s. I don't know how true it is today. At that point in time, when they were looking at the high schools, they found that only 10% of girls were, or only 10% of the grade 12 classes uh, in computers and some of the other STEM things, uh, there's only 10% girls. And one of the reasons that girls were saying that they weren't going into it is because it was nerdy or geeky. And there's a, I think a, a greater stigma for girls being geeks than there is for guys being geeks. Um, and I think that, that that needs to be as a society kind of addressed and attacked if if we want to get more girls into stem is we need to make stem less geeky nerdy rarefied we, it needs to be more cool somehow yeah i think it, i think it would help every everyone but i think it would help girls more than guys because i think in high school that was a reason that was being cited uh, more often for girls yeah, I, agree. I I also find that uh, maybe one some one part of it is boys grow up playing video games, and I don't know why girls don't play video games because it is very cool, but I also don't know if it is because most of the many video games are you know structured towards fighting, and uh, maybe at a younger age there are more less girls who want to get into that. When I'm talking about a young age, I'm saying really young, like five, six, seven years old. And that's why they're not really going much into video games. And because boys just grow up with video games, moving into technology just automatically seems a, a cool path for them because it is cool for them to be able to talk about programming and the cool things that they can do because they're already so exposed to animation and different programs and the different speeds and different graphics and things like that. I, I think what we need to start it young where uh, many schools now, I mean, I find in Canada or maybe maybe in other places, also many schools are actually introducing programming as a subject for kids from when they are really young. And in spite of, like, for example, my own daughter, I try to get her books on programming before and say, do this. And it just sounded so geeky to her and she just never went into it at all. But at one point when they started doing a project in school and she sat down and did it by herself, and you know, created graphics and things like that and different cool things just by writing programs. It was just so highly interesting to her. So I think instead of uh, you know making programming or things like that sound like these big complicated robots, instead of just constantly connecting them to a complicated robot, if you just make it really simple, if you make the most basic games by designing something and by you know creating something by using you know graphics and you know uh, like. I, I even find like just to get my kids more involved in the technicalities or the amazing things that your user interface can do, I let them download TikTok. Though that it seems very counterproductive, 
But even though I was saying TikTok was a huge waste of time, I am so impressed with the kind of videos that you can create, right? With the kind of computer graphics that you can put in where there is speed and there is designing and there is a lot of thinking and work that even goes into creating a TikTok video. And it's not just about uh, social media and things like that. There is a lot of smart stuff that goes in. And I think those kind of tools that get incorporated into children's play from when they are young will get them to be more uh, thinkers. And automatically you have more video games and things like that that even girls want to play. And then everyone just starts moving more into the tech industry and it doesn't become boys versus girls. I think a lot of things like what Michael was mentioning was this mindset that video games is boys and robots are boys and girls don't do that kind of stuff. So I think that really needs to change from the games from when they are young. Yes, yeah. Richard, thank you. We also have a comment from Manpreet. Would you like to unmute yourself, Manpreet, and explain this a little bit or I can read it? Yeah, no, that's no problem. No, I was just going to say that, um, you know, it's kind of like a society problem, but it's also, you know, in so many different levels. Um, you know, I've worked with educators and it's a lot about um, the educators that our children are exposed to if they're in a scenario where, you know, they, you know, it's, it's deemed normal and fun. These are the fun courses. Everyone likes it, the, both the girls and the boys, but a lot of times our children may or may not get that exposure. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, girls, you know, my girls play Minecraft as, with their friends mm -hmm. as much as any boys. So it's a lot, it's a lot about parents' attitudes and teachers, educators' um, attitudes as well. Do they give girls that exposure in the first place to see if it's fun or not to, to play with robots or programming? Definitely. I definitely, I definitely think it is something that uh, comes from parents. I mean, my interest, I, I, to be honest, I haven't ever done much with robotics at all. I wish I did, but uh, I haven't done much of this stuff. But my interest itself came from my parents always pushing me to solve puzzles and to think for myself and come up with you no know, design ideas. Like my dad wouldn't be like, just sit and watch TV. He'd be like, okay, how about you come and solve this issue that we are now facing in the society? How do you solve this? And just coming up with those kind of algorithmic ideas just promotes uh, being thinkers. And I also think for sure the language needs to change. Uh, this was something that my cousin had brought up to me a long time back where she had, you know, she was showing me one of the sample subjects, one of the sample homework that was given to one of my, uh, you know, one of the kids in, in India actually. And it just said, uh, there was some, some question you need to solve. And it said, you know, go and ask your uh, dad how much time it takes to change the wheels of a car and go and ask your mom, how many jars of pickle would you usually use in a month? And it was just a very basic question that is possibly written uh, in a very generic family situation. But her point was very clearly, if, you, if your school subjects itself always start positioning your questions as moms are in the kitchen and go ask your dad the cool stuff, if it's about cars or if it's about uh, you know, any sort of tools or things like that, then automatically that mindset just goes into girls that this is, you know, this is a man's job and this is not my job. How many girls are for are in fact actually taught about, you know, changing the wheels of a car or how to work with tools and things like that? Or mechanical engineering, that's definitely something that not that many girls go into at all because they're not made to think it's cool and they're not made to think that it is a shared responsibility. So it is um, the mindset that I think that needs to change a lot and the way we approach it. At, like I said, at this point, I really think it should not. I, I love how the world is actually going towards equity and towards specifically changing the language to be more women focused. And you have a lot of men coming and saying, if it's all equal, then why are you talking so much about women? It should just be equal. But it wasn't equal. And for you to bring it back to equal, there has to be a push. And that push, I think, has to come from both the men and women in the industry, for sure. Thank you. Yes, for sure. I know that would also mean communicating to the parents of these kids, which is probably where a lot of this also comes from. Oh, and then another comment, Manpreet, would you like to just continue? Um, sorry, yeah, I, I wanted to also say that I, I feel like a lot of um, programming events, they always target children that are um, older and attracting girls to STEM subjects when they're in high school or even, um, you know, grade 12 or making university decisions already. 
Um, but I think honestly, uh, uh, children's attitudes towards math and science, uh, it's, you know, it's set early. So, you know, at the younger ages, I think it's, it's really important to expose children to those opportunities. So they see that it, as it is fun, it's not necessarily hard. Yes, definitely. Is, G, would you like to comment on that anymore? Or I can oh, yeah, continue. Yeah, exactly. I definitely agree. I think it is uh, something that needs to start from when the kids are way younger than when the kids are older. Because by then their mind is already set a certain way and then we don't want to go into that. And I also think uh, the meaning of STEM is not very clear to many children. Like my own kids seem to think STEM is uh, just robotics and you know when you say joy you know you should do stem subjects or you want to put them in a stem course in school and they're like i don't want to do robotics i don't want to do programming but it isn't just that apparently the whole science industry itself comes under stem even doctors are considered stem i was reading recently about it to see what all actually comes under stem and so much comes under stem and i think that needs to also be clear to children so because they seem to think that it's just programming and it's just computers. And maybe they're interested in not computers, which is fine. But there is so much more that is out there that is also considered STEM. So yeah, I think it's more of a mindset thing for men children at all. It should just be just as simple as anything else in the industry and not something that is only very challenging and only extremely smart people can get into it. And you should have certain kind of grades to get into it. That kind of uh, mindset needs to change. Yeah, I'm in chemistry and I didn't realize until my second year of my undergrad as a female in chemistry, I've never really related to the people in STEM. And then I realized, oh, I am a woman in STEM. Yeah. And it took me that long to figure it out. Exactly. So, it's yeah, very interesting. So you think getting other fields in STEM to be identified as STEM? Yes. I think that's just as I think that's just as important. Maybe the girls. Maybe because they don't really know how many women are already in STEM or how many thinkers and how many amazing people around are in STEM, they think that it only has to do something with the robotics industry. And the, the, like I've been trying to tell my daughter, robotics is now entering every industry. You even have uh, robots performing surgery. So there, that is a really great subject to go for in the first place. But I still think it uh, needs to be clearer to them that this encompasses everything. That you can have varied interests and not think that just because I'm going into STEM, I'm going to go into one particular direction and I'm just going to be programming. No, maybe you're not programming. And maybe we should incorporate a lot of arts also into STEM, like you know, graphical designing and things like that, which is also very cool. Yes, and I think this is right at the end of our time. So if anyone has any more questions, otherwise I'll share my screen and give our closing remarks. This is your last chance to ask me questions. Okay, I think that's it then. If you could stop sharing your screen so I can share, or I think I can. You can kick me off, I guess. There we go. So thank you everybody for coming to this brown bag event. I'd like to invite you all to our science symposium mega finale on the 29th. Um, we'll be featuring all of the finalists as well as some more entertainment and speakers. And that is yeah the 29th at noon Pacific Standard Time. And you can figure that out for your own time zone. And so once again, thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you at the mega finale. Thank you and thank you G. We love your presentation. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ashley and Noween K. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll see you at the next uh, uh, brown bag.